Games fans after last Sunday's hurling semi-finals. Well, the debate has centred around the Galway-Tipperary match, the many incidents which took place during and after the game, and the handling of the match by the referee. Well, the, dis the discussion has been about Antrim's great win over Offaly, and whether or not they have a realistic chance over Tip in the final. Well, I was in Northern Ireland during the week, and I can tell you the entire province is celebrating and hoping that Tyrone's footballers can make it an Ulster double in the All-Ireland finals next month. Well, if Tyrone are to do that, they'll have to beat the Connacht champions Mayo. And that's the task facing them tomorrow at Croke Park. It's another busy day at headquarters, starting with the second of the minor hurling semi-finals between Offaly and Down at 12.30. The minor football semi-final between Roscommon and Derry is at 2. And that's followed by the senior game between... Tyrone players have felt pressure in the past. Not like this. Can Conway do it for Tyrone? He flicks it in. And hits the post, it's over the bar. The sides are level, incredible, Liam. The two players collided, and here's O'Hagan through. Into McKenna, certainly a chance for Tyrone. Back to O'Hagan, it must be. It's a goal. Beautiful score by O'Hagan. Beautiful play by Tyrone. We follow Tyrone, boys, wherever they may go. Wherever they may go, Sloan is set me or me oh. We'll follow Tyrone with the red hand flying high. A lovely sight beneath an Irish sky Because we love them, we love them A team that is a credit to us all And we're always there to answer to the call To the team that is the envy of them all Kevin McCabe taking it quickly, Plunkett Donaghy wasn't expecting it Again it's aimed towards Uji McKenna Kevin McCabe, the T-shirt says Tyrone unfinished business. That, of course, refers to 1986 when you came quite close to winning the All-Ireland title. Yes, um, back in 86 we did come close. Uh, we fell at the last hurdle. Uh, we now meet Mayo, so um, we're hoping to get a tough game again, Mayo, but get by that one and hopefully do the business in 89. His own recently established business has been going very well in 89. Power screens supply guards for industrial machinery, and much of that work is done here at the factory in Dungannon. For McCabe, it's an important step forward, and in his football career, he's taken a step forward too, out of the defence and into the attack. Even back then, I've always stepped forward for my club, Clano. Um, so forwards hasn't been a big change, but it's, it's nice to go up there along with Damon Higgins and Eugene McKenna, playing off them rather than to them. You're, of course, a great friend of uh, Damien O'Hagan's. You mentioned Juju McKenna as well. You're some of the more established players in this Tyrone team. That's obviously going to be important on Sunday. Yeah, Eugene would be considered the daddy of us all. Um, he's, he's up there. He's the eldest. Myself, Damien, Aidan Skelton, um, and Kieran McGarvey, Sean Donnelly. We go back as far as Minor in 1975. So we've been going a long time, and it's getting near the end. Kevin McCabe contemplating retiring after this year's championship. His good friend Damien O'Hagan would also like to make up for 86. Yeah, I can't wait to Sunday. It is a great chance for us to get back there and prove ourselves uh, for a job that was left undone the last time we were there. Do you look back with any regrets over that final? Because you did have Kerry on the rack that day. Many people said you should have beaten them. I look back on that game as a uh, big nightmare. It was a great game for us and a big occasion for us. And we had a great chance of beating Kerry and uh, failed to do it. But maybe this time we'll put things right. So what has been the difference this year then? The difference this year is that the panel has all got together. We got promotion, as you know, from Division 3 to Division 2. And uh, there's a lot of players have got hungry for the game again. And it just all went right for us. We've had a bit of luck as well. People still weren't quite sure of you going into the Ulster final this year, and that one ended in a draw, but there seemed to me to be a marked difference in the way you played between the draw match and the replay. You seem to have come on a lot, even in that short time. Yes, well, I think the first day that we played Donegal, we were very lucky to get out with a draw. Uh, Donegal played well that day. The heat that day had a big, uh, played a big part in the game. The second day we went, and we seemed to know what we wanted to do that day, that we really wanted to win, especially losing to Monaghan the year before. And it's nip and tuck with seconds remaining. Again, again, the substitute. In towards Shovlin. Towards Tommy Ryan. Can he provide the winning score? It's in. It's over the bar. 
Donegal are in front, they're ecstatic. And surely that's the end of it. Surely Donegal have clinched the Ulster title in 1989. Beautiful score by Tommy Ryan. Back into the action, here come Tyrone, they're not beaten yet. Then to O'Higgins. He certainly was pulled down as he moved through. The referee will give the free. And the pressure now turns once again to Stephen Conway. And as I said earlier on, the point that Kevin McCabe got, which wasn't allowed, could be a talking point at the end of the game if Conway happens to steer this one the wrong way. But certainly Tyrone players have felt pressure in the past. Not like this. Can Conway do it for Tyrone? He flicks it in. It hits the post, it's over the bar. The sides are level. Incredible, Liam. Tyrone have had a little bit of luck throughout this game and the luck has continued there. Stephen Comey hit the ball well and it just tipped in off the side of the post. Referee Michael Greenan calls for the ball, the match is over. It's a draw, 11 points each. A last minute let off for Tyrone, but they played much better in the replay to take the Ulster title. So the town of Oma looks forward to perhaps even greater glory and one of the local players, Shawnee Myler, is hoping to be part of it. The atmosphere at the moment is pretty electric. I, I travel myself, so I, I get about all the county, and uh, I'll be travelling around Oma, or the shops in Oma, and if there are flags out, and uh, very much excited about it. All thinking back to '86 and looking for another out in Crow Park. I'm very excited, to be part of this present squad, playing along with the likes of Eugene McKenna, Kieran McGarvey, Damon O'Hagan, and Kevin McCabe. Uh, it's a great honour for someone like myself. I watched these players play in 1986 and it uh, was a great thrill to watch them. And now I'll actually be going out and playing in Crow Park along with these players. Uh, it's, it's a dream come true. <laughs> the throne dressing room, the uh, players have been there before. Uh, they sort of co they concentrate among themselves. Uh, we we, are, we don't go in for this uh, sort of roaring and shouting that, uh, that builds up a team. Each player uh, takes a minute or two to himself and thinks about what he's going to do on the day. O'Neill Park and John Gannon, where the Tyrone team gather for the second last time before tomorrow's big clash with Mayo. Fitness is not now the issue in these training sessions. That presumably has already been achieved. Now it's a matter of keeping the form ticking over and fine-tuning skills like place-kicking, the crucial responsibility for which rests on the shoulders of one of the younger players, Stephen Conway. Proudly on display here in O'Neill Park, John Gannon, tonight is the Ulster Cup in the possession of Tyrone and Stephen Conway with me now. You're very instrumental in bringing that cup here. Um, I suppose so, Michael. Lucky enough that point went over at the end and people might say it was the points that clinched it or at least got us a second bite at the cherry. And when we did get a second bite, we took full advantage of it. There could be a few big kicks to take against Mayo on Sunday. As the free taker, does that put you under extra pressure, knowing that you have to produce it on the day? Yeah, well, it depends really how the first one goes. If the first one goes fairly well, uh, it makes it a lot easier. But if the first one doesn't go too well, I just have to maybe take more responsibility on my shoulders and maybe just accept that it's going to have to go well and hit the next one, maybe make sure it goes over. Looking at this present Tyrone team, there seems to be a good blend of experience and youth. You would represent the youth at 23, one of the younger players in the side. Yeah, it's forcing the way things have worked out. This year we've got a few players that came through the National League. John McGoldrick's been outstanding so far in the Championship. Kieran Carr likewise has played really well at half-forward. And you still have the old heads like Gigi McKenna, Damon O'Hagan, and Kevin McCabe. And one or two of those have been around for quite a number of years, so it's a good blend. Mind you, for Fergal McConnell, who replaces Aidan Skelton in the Tyrone goal, tomorrow is a big test. So he'll be relying on the experience of the older players around him. The one man that all Tyrone looks to for inspiration is their brilliant forward, Eugene McKenna, the oldest member of the team. Well, I'm not that experienced. I may be old enough, but we've only been there, I think it's three or four times now. But certainly it, it uh, doesn't get any easier. It doesn't get any less exciting. <laughs> Well, it's hectic stuff here on one of the final nights before uh, the big game against Mayo. Obviously, you're looking forward to that match and looking forward to be back in Croke Park after 86. Yeah, 86 was a great year, but in fact, it ended up a bit of a disappointment as far as we were concerned. 
We felt that we could have won the All-Ireland. We felt it going into the match and we're disappointed after it. In spite of what the general public thought that we'd done well, we didn't feel we'd done well. Had you a feeling this year, at the beginning of the championship, that Tyrone had the material to be Ulster champions? Mm, to be truthful, not any more than any other year. Um, I was a little bit in two minds whether I would play this year at all or not because I didn't feel I would have the time or just be physically able to do the type of training that was required. I'm glad now in hindsight that I did get involved. But no, I wouldn't say any more this year than any other year. Now, there's one interesting thing about your side of the draw, which is most people would say it's the easier side, that the Cork-Dublin side is, is the tougher. Yeah. I suppose you would have to agree with that point of view. That's probably a fair comment, yeah. Well, I suppose the one motivating factor from a Tyrone point of view is it would be great for some of you guys to be back in Croke Park in that All-Ireland final again after 86. Oh, very much so. Like, when you've been there once, I think it, it gives you that incentive to get back there again. But at 84 was the first time, in fact, that I played in the All-Ireland semi-final. And it's only five years ago, so we're, and that's, in terms of that, we're not that experienced as far as the All-Ireland semi-finals are concerned. On the anniversary of internment in the north, there's a strong British Army presence around Dungannon tonight. But for the Tyrone players, their thoughts are concentrated on the task ahead against Mayo. Keeping their minds concentrated is Donald Donnelly, who took over as team manager from Art McCrory two years ago. Well, that's true in one way, but in another way, I have been sort of with the Tyrone team for some years previously. I wasn't there in 86, and Art and I had uh, worked together before that. And in the early 70s, when Tyrone uh, built most of the footballers that they have now. Uh, I was there with him, and he was me. And uh, I wasn't a stranger to them. I knew what their capabilities were, and I knew that once we got the motivation right, we could go forward again. Looking forward to Sunday's game against Mayo. Obviously, you've done your homework on the Mayo team. What do you think of them? Well, I saw them on TV the first day. I couldn't get to it because we had a replay ourselves. I went over to see their replay on the second day, I was very impressed with their uh, midfield diamond, centre-half, centre-half forward and their two midfielders. Tremendous catches of a ball, great workers uh, move from defence to attack. Uh, that, I think, would be their strength and uh, something that we'd have to work on to try to keep the ball away from them. Looking at your performance in the Ulster Championship, which you won in a replay against Donegal in the final, are you happy with the way the team came through Ulster? Yes. we. Had a lot of things uh, working against us and we overcame them all. Uh, the real sweat we got, of course, was in the final uh, against Donegal. I don't think that we played particularly well. We've played a lot of very negative football. I think we've got that out of our system. And it's a thing that, you know, kills northern teams going south, that uh, they go down to stop teams rather than to beat them. And I hope that that's not the attitude that we'd be going to Dublin with. Uh, we've built up a lot of experience over the last few years. Uh, we fully respect Mayo. Uh, they have had two great games in the championship, with one with Dublin and the other with uh, me in the last couple of years. They know what they're about. Uh, I would say they're sort of a, an enigmatic team. They can be brilliant or otherwise, and I hope next uh, Sunday is one of their otherwise days. Uh, Donald, having watched uh, Mayo in the Connacht Championship and you in the Ulster Championship, most neutral observers would say that Mayo are the lighter, more skillful team, whereas Tyrone are perhaps tougher and will use their physical presence uh, in Croke Park on Sunday. What's your reaction to that? Well, I, I think that a lot of that has been built up uh, with our matches in the early part of the Ulster Championship. Uh, again, uh, I don't think we were guilty of the things that uh, where we were supposed to have done. We are a strong, we are a physical team, and uh, we're not ashamed of that. That's the way we have built the team. And if you're going to win an All-Ireland, that's the way you have to be. But we are not a dirty team, and we are a good football team, and that's what we're going to Dublin to prove. The full deck once more. He's had a fine game so far for Tyrone. Back to Kilpatrick. And the half-back line of Tyrone certainly looked very, very solid today. Donaghy, the long ball. Once more, will it bounce? But Levy nicely cut out by the Donegal man. With a bit of a blunder. The two players collided, and here's O'Hagan through into McKenna. Certainly a chance for Tyrone. Back to O'Hagan, it must be. It's a goal. Beautiful score by O'Hagan. Beautiful play by Tyrone. That was superb, Liam Hayes. McKenna has been superb at the edge of the square. And towards McNally, and here comes Tyrone once more. McNally cuts back and looks for the angle, and the shot. The ball's over the bar. And Tyrone are dominant. Joe Madden once again breaking through. Will the bounce elude? Did it full back? It does. It comes to McKenna. He's got options either side. 
Kicks the ball on himself. He goes for the point. Is it over the bar? It is over the bar. And that was really superb by Will Eugene McKenna. And Conway will want to slot this one over. The man who got that equalising score in the last minute last week. He drops it in. And he drops it over the black spot. That's a goal and two points for Conway. And the score now, 2-5 to the Throne. Not six, Donegal. Well, if Tyrone could win this Ulster title, they can certainly claim to be the team of the 80s as far as Ulster goes. Donegal and Tyrone have two wins apiece in the Ulster Championship. This would be Tyrone's hat-trick if they can do it, if they can hang on. The minutes tick away. McCabe looks for his first score. He puts it in. Oh, that's quite superb from McCabe. The man, the all-star. Brilliant. Back in 86, we did come close. Uh, we fell at the last hurdle. Uh, we now meet Mayo, so um, we're hoping to Get a tough game again, Mayo, but get by that one and hopefully do the business in 89. Uh, the one thing that we have over the team in 86 is uh, strength and depth. We have a very good panel. We have uh, at least seven or eight men who can fit into any part of the team without uh, causing us any great worry or distress. I think that's the one thing that Art hadn't got in, in, in 86, and it's the one thing that caught them out eventually when a few of the backs were, went injured. Now, I think we're stronger from that point of view uh, and I hope that the football that he played then remains. Well, in many ways, Mayo's story is quite similar to Tyrone's as they approach tomorrow's confrontation. 1985 was nearly Mayo's year as they went within a whisker of shocking the dubs for a place in the All-Ireland final. Well, now they are back again, hoping to go one better. But they've struggled too in the Connacht Championship, and they certainly went about defending their title the hard way. Tommy Gorman has been looking at their build-up to the semi-final. by Liam McHale. Ball inside to Ray Dempsey with Matthew Riley. Still Dempsey, the 19-year-old. Frank Noonan in advanced spot right on the end line. Durkin, brilliant goal! Oh, a super goal by Noel Durkin! supporters a, a lot of worries this year. Uh, two games, or two teams, two replays. We may be giving our supporters a lot of worries, but we're giving the kind of council a lot of money, so they're happy, whatever our supporters. From Galway to Dublin, from Derry to Kerry, in Newport and Frisco and Boston also. In Pittsburgh, Chicago, Detroit and Toronto, they're stout-hearted men from the county Mayo. So I swing together in all kinds of weather. Don't show the white feather wherever you go. Be like a brother and love one another. Like the true-hearted men from the county Mayo. The boys from the County Mayo began their championship campaign on June the 25th in Chewham. Their supporters knew they hadn't won two consecutive comic titles since 1950-51. Referee John Mullaney proved to be a controversial figure. The breeze limited good football and the fans saw very few flowing moves, with the odd exception. It's Morris wanted to take it quickly. Frank Noon giving the return. And McHale 
showing such delightful fluency into Durkin. Goal chance here, high challenge, penalty. It's a high challenge, I think, by Broderick. We'll watch it again. This was one of Mayo's very few penetrating attacks. In fact, 50 minutes passed before they scored a point from play. And in this instance, they went on to miss the penalty. But in the closing minutes, they got their noses in front. This is Dermot Flanagan about to loft a free high into the Galway danger area. The flick down comes from Liam McHale and Sean Maher scores the goal. Galway's hopes then hanging by a thread. John Joyce trying to wait for the block of the ball. Tomas Mannion. They need a goal here, Galway. Otherwise, they're out of the Connor Championship. Gay McMahon is in. Lovin, it's a goal! Oh, I don't believe it! It's a goal which has come two minutes or nearly two minutes into injury time. Gay McManus punished Mayo for losing concentration in the dying minutes. For the replay in Castlebar a fortnight later, Mayo made changes. John Finn and Jimmy Burke came in for Pat Holmes and Martin Carney. And Mayo got off to a great start with one more dubious refereeing decision. Anthony Finnerty, well caught by the Mayo man. Has Jimmy Burke to his right, a drive by Anthony Finnerty to Jimmy Burke. What's on here? It's a penalty. The Mayo supporters are thrilled with themselves getting a penalty so early in the game. Only seven minutes gone. Anthony Finnerty with the kick. He nets it. A good goal by Anthony Finnerty. The drama continued in a first half full of niggling fouls. When John Finn looks at this replay, maybe he'll feel more ashamed than Michael Brennan, who was sent off for that body contact. And the controversy continued. Mayo Sean Marr ran 20 yards to get involved in the scuffles. There he is in the right-hand corner of the picture. He didn't cause any great damage to John Joyce, but if only for his foolishness, he deserved to be sent off. Still, on the day, Mayo had heroes as well as villains. ...to Frank Noon, who called well for the ball. Frank Noon, looking for the point. That looks a very good one by Frank Noon. Oh, that's glorious football by Frank Noon. Credit him with the point, but credit him also with the run, and he called for that ball as Kevin McStay attempted to go by his man. Although TJ Kilgallen wasn't fully fit, when he came on as a sub, he steadied Mayo. He sent in this crucial free kick in the second half. Liam McHale scoring a goal fit to grace any game. Final score, Mayo 2-13, Galway 1-8. Two weeks later, Ross Scommon came to Castlebar for the Connacht final. Again, Mayo made changes. Gabriel Irwin, TJ Kilgallen and Ray Dempsey came in for Eugene Lavin, Dennis Carney and Anthony Finnerty. And Ross Scommon it was who got off to a great start. Vincent Glennon came through after the Mayo defence was split and scored that fine goal. So Mayo's character was under scrutiny. They fought well to get back on terms. This was one of several fine moves. Kevin McStay there finishing with the point. Mayo's shooting in the second half was dreadful, and they almost paid the penalty. This is Vincent Lennon. Can he get room to swing that boot? Into Paul Early! Oh, a great save! A marvellous save by Gabriel Irwin. Paul Early had every right to be annoyed. The match ended level, so it was back to Roscommon a week later. This time Mayo were unchanged, and what followed was a magnificently exciting match that ended in a draw. Mayo went into the second period of extra time trailing by three points. And they spent the first 13 minutes of that period giving their supporters heart conditions. Michael Fitzmaurice, this is a better position, about 40 metres out. But the third wide that he's kicked in the second period of extra time. The absence of an informed free taker on the left hand side of the field wasn't their only weakness. They all squandered several opportunities from play as well. Then, when all seemed lost, the game turned for Mayo.
run forward by Brian Kilkelly. Can he make a difference? Into Willie Joe Patton. Finnerty. It's a goal by Anthony Finnerty. That score levelled the match. Michael Fitzmaurice added a quick point to put Mayo on the lead. And then full forward, Jimmy Burke got in on the act. This is Mikhail. That's Jimmy Burke. Oh, he's missed it. And it somehow goes over the goal. So Mayo have retained their comic title for the first time since 1951. But what are the chances of going further? This week, we've been talking to three key personalities. When Mayo's trainer, John O'Mahony, goes in search of divine assistance, he is accompanied by his wife, Jer, and five daughters. He's quite defensive about the character of the present Mayo team. The panel that's there at the moment, we have some young players in it, but generally, overall, it's there, it has been there for quite some time. Uh, the, the main point, I, I think, that has come through loud and clear from this team this year is the resilience of the team. Uh, I, 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 you just have to stand back and admire it. Uh, against Galway, we were, we were eight, eight points to two down uh, 20 minutes into the second half and we missed a penalty and we came back, should have won the match, only drew it in the end. We were uh, down against Roscommon in the first match and we came back and really we uh, were nearly caught again in, in, in Hyde Park in, in the replay, but uh, we kept our cool and came back to win the match. Uh, resilience would have to be the outstanding feature of this team. Will you consider it a failure if you actually lose on Sunday? Uh, we're not going to Crow Park to lose on Sunday. We're not going to make up the numbers. We have we fully realised that Tyrone, a very experienced team, they have been there in 86, and we give them every respect. We're delighted that uh, they will be going in as hot favourites and uh, we'll certainly give it everything we've got. How about your forwards, uh, John? Um, they would seem to have difficulty putting away scores. Uh, you'll make the point that they've scored a lot from play, but they've missed an awful lot as well in the championship. Uh, we have missed some scores, but our forwards are, have been criticised uh, down the years, really, and particularly maybe this year. Uh, my argument against that, to a certain extent, would be that we scored 314 against Roscommon. Uh, we got 112 uh, against Roscommon the first day, and we put up a good score against Galway as well. Having said that, I think it, we have created more chances than we have put away, and we will be looking for an improvement in that department. Balana is more than proud of Mayo captain Jimmy Brown. He's one of three local men in tomorrow's team. Jimmy studied videos of the Connacht final draw against Roscommon in Castle Bar. He came to the conclusion that Tony McManus is lethal if allowed clean possession. So for the replay, Jimmy decided to take corrective action. He's spotting something there as McHale was coming out for that. And the Mayo backs holding a Roscommon forward. Brown again, magnificent. Terrific performance. Joey Carleton crossing the Mayo 45 metre line. Tony McManus tried to steal inside Jimmy Brown, who's been superb so far. Last year, we didn't believe in ourselves that we could do it. I mean, like, you know, like most teams from Connacht or even Ulster, they go up to, you know, if they get that far, that's probably good enough. But uh, hopefully this year that we're, you know, we're going to go one step further. Jimmy was injured during that match against Roscommon. Well, I remember uh, going for the ball, and uh, I just had got the ball, and it, it slipped away from me. And I remember Pat Dory from coming from the side and just hit me. I don't remember anything after that. Like, it's only the last few, a few minutes of the game that I got really bad in the, in the dugout, and they had to take me away in the ambulance. How do you see the particular game shaping up? How would you analyse the two teams and the match ahead of you? Um, with Tyrone, like, you know, you, you, against Donegal, you, you don't give them a second chance. You know, they, I mean, they drew the first day, which was unfortunate for Donegal. But um, the same with ourselves, like, you know, we, ha we, have, we don't give us a second chance either. We have, you know, a good, strong team. You know, Tyrone have much the same, the big men, middle of the field. I think centre half back as well, very tall, very big. And um, it's going to count around the middle of the field. In the far off football crazy peninsula of Eris, Willie Joe Padden is God. 
And the only topic of conversation this week is football, Mayo football. How many spare tickets can you give her out? Uh, tickets, I think, it's something like 70 the club got around here. That's all, 70 that all tickets. Yeah. 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 So, um, and we could do it about 200. At least 200. Yeah. At least 200. Yeah. That's big, two, a big interest in the game, yeah. There's two buses that even didn't buy alone, I believe. There is. There is. Proud day for them, having Gabriel Irwin, the junior yeah, crosses. Yeah. 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 Proud day for Aris, the two. Yeah. two yeah. Very well. It's great stuff. Looking forward to it now, Anil. <laughs> Willie Joe is probably Mayo's most popular player. Part of the respect is due to the sacrifices he makes. Well, we trained one night a week for the league. Well, we trained uh, near Bellinay there, so that wasn't too bad for me, really. It was a break in the journey. But uh, from the 4th of March, I think, we started training for the championship. So we've been doing it four times a week in or around since. Starting this evening now, it's just the start of the week again. Um, we go to Castle Bar this evening. Um, 56 miles, one, 112 miles return, um, train for about two hours, then I get home probably around 11.30, and um, Thursday night again, same routine, and on Saturday morning at quarter past 11. That's, um, that's the type of mileage I put up for the week. Willie Joe Patton seemed to be tripped, referee allowed an advantage, and it comes off, and Mayo go back in front. There was a little muddle between Fitzmaurice and Willie Joe, seemed to be tripped there. The referee said play on. Willie Joe regained his balance and composure and stuck it over the crossbar. Well, the more direct the football is, uh, from my point of view, uh, the more I like it, really. Tyrone are a very direct team. Um, they kick, they, they're very good fielders. They kick long ball in. We have some very good fielders as well, like uh, with Lee McHale, Sean Maher and TJ Kilgallen. I think that will suit us. But uh, we seem to, we play, we short pass at times, maybe. Uh, like, we build up from, from uh, our half-back line. Uh, I think... Uh, there will be nothing between the teams, really. Like They play pretty much the same type of football. So it could come down to who takes the chances? Well, I think that's definitely what will happen, yeah, really. Uh, whatever team makes the least mistakes and uh, put away the chances, uh, I think it'll be, it'll be a very, very close game. And Peter Ford, a right hold battle going on between these two fine players. This is John Finn from Mayo Gales. To Willie Joe Padden, added to and given to Kevin Max Day. Give it inside, back to Padden. This is looking good for Mayo, still Padden, and over the bar. The sides are level. Your team captain, uh, Jimmy Brown, was telling me that you're called the um, Ian Botham of Mayo. <laughs> well, some of the boys call me that, all right, yeah. I don't think, um, maybe there's a slight resemblance, yeah, but my pay his paychecks didn't get mixed up in mine yet, anyhow. <laughs> well, if you win in All-Ireland, will you be going into politics? Would that be the natural progression for you? I'll tell you, Tommy, when I win the All-Ireland, I'll sit back, I'll relax, I'll enjoy it, and then I'll decide after that what's the best thing to do. That sounds like a politician's answer there. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> In this year's championship, Mayo supporters have seen the best and worst of their team. When on song, Mayo are a joy to watch. And that's curled over. Fitzmaurice has kicked his third free. Neatly into the path there of Anthony Finnerty. High and ambitiously so, and it's curled in and over the bar. But the play goes on. John Finn from here. What a good match John Finn has had. Fouled crudely. Jimmy Brown, the Mayo captain, has had a much better game today to Anthony Finnerty. You just feel now that Mayo are on fire at last and that. They're beginning to put a few moves together. Anthony Finnerty to Kevin Max Day. He could crown this with a nice point. That's a great ball by Kevin Max Day. But the supporters have had reason to moan as well as cheer. Well, the tempo of this game was quite fast, quite exciting in the early stages. It has dropped considerably, and you can see why. It wasn't a good ball, and Frank Noon did very well to read it and give it to Peter Ford, who, in, who has lost it. And it's a free end for the foul on Brian O'Donnell. Kay McManus tries the short one to Kevin Walsh and goes for the return. The slip by Willie Joe Padden gave Kay McManus the chance of the high one. Knocked down by John Joyce. Eric Elwood rushes in. It's been put wide. The umpire was just not sure for a second. And then he flagged it wide. This is easily the most influential player of field. He'll give it to his right to Anthony Finnerty, perhaps here. Or go it alone. Lee McHale, a great run. And then he puts it badly, badly wide. I just wonder which Mayo team will we see tomorrow? 
Well, in about an hour's time, John O'Mahony will meet the panel members in Kinnegad and they'll travel into Dublin. Interestingly, on the ground in Mayo this week, the team's supporters seem quite sceptical about their chances, whereas the players themselves seem quietly confident. I think it's fascinating that in the course of the four championship games, only two Mayo players, Peter Ford and Jimmy Brown, held their positions. So obviously, John O'Mahony is searching for the best combination. I think Mayo can win tomorrow, but to do so, they'll have to rise above their Connacht form. They'll have to rise to the occasion in Croke Park. That's the view from the West, Michael. Back to you. Tommy Gorman reporting there. Well, unfortunately, one man who won't be able to make it to Croke Park tomorrow is the legendary Josie Munnally, who was an All-Ireland medal winner with Mayo in 1936. Josie is in hospital at the moment, but he's looking forward to seeing Mayo in the final, and we send him our good wishes. Well, to a neutral observer, there doesn't appear to be anything between the sides tomorrow. It certainly has the makings of a close, exciting game. And let's hope that it follows on the example of the first hurling semi-final between Antrim and Offaly last Sunday, rather than the second. Well, as always, you can follow the action throughout the afternoon on RTE Television. Frank Noonan in advanced spot right on the end line.